Hey world, you're listening to Globe Thotter, the pod that puts the lover in travel lover. I'm your fearless and flirty host, Cassie Martinez. A solo traveler and digital nomad for over seven years in Gounding, I've mixed business with pleasure ever since my first solo trip in 2016, when I ditched my flight home after falling in love in and with Lisbon. Join me each episode as I swap juicy travel stories with a slew of amazing adventurers who, like me, kiss and tell. Dating, backpacking, main character moments, we're going there. And you're coming with me. What is up, travel lovers? Emphasis on lovers. How are we doing? If you're listening to this episode right around the time it's released, Just picture me in some sort of PJs or sweats situation, cuddled up with my dog on the couch and working my butt off. Yep, I am currently in hustle mode because I've got just a few weeks until I head off to Europe for the summer to host Globethotter's sold out series of group trips in both Portugal and Croatia. And I am spending this last window of time crossing my T's and dotting my I's so I can truly allow myself to be 100% present with my group trip girlies. See, something you may not know about me is that I'm actually a freelance social media strategist. One of the most compatible gigs for digital nomads out there because you can do so much work ahead of time. I love personally hitting the road with a low maintenance client or two on my own freelancer roster because someone's gonna pay these hostile world bills, all right? And today's guest, Sojourner White, knows exactly what I'm talking about. A full-time traveling social worker and creator of Sojourneys.com, which is a wildly resourceful travel and lifestyle website that, quote, helps nine to fivers bask in more freedom and flexibility outside of the office. Sojourner, whose name literally translates into someone who resides in a place temporarily, works her nine to five completely digitally while largely staying in hostels. Last year, Sojourner even dedicated four months to backpacking to various hostels sprinkled throughout the US, largely by train, a vastly overlooked and underrated means of transport in the States that after this episode, I have a feeling you'll be much more open to giving a try. Filled with real life resources and actionable tips to help you on your way to becoming more location independent, This episode dives deep into topics like how to dip your toe into slow travel, the actual vibes inside of a US hostel versus those that are abroad, and of course, travel dating, but from the perspective of a romantic who just so happens to be a realist. Yes, we exist. So buckle up and lift those tray tables because globe fodder is taking off. Well, Sojourner, thank you so much for joining us today, entering in the Globe Thotter Galaxy. Where are you joining us from? I am joining you from my childhood room. I live at home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I moved back here during the pandemic when it first started. Shout out childhood bedrooms. I am currently in mine as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. No, same, same, same for me. I moved back to Texas, height of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can relate, but when that hit the fan, I knew exactly where I needed to be. No, legit. I was in grad school and it was like, mm, are you going to go abroad right now? Probably not. So oh. you need to just go oh ahead and, and go back yeah. home. <laughs> so that is essentially what I did. Yeah, totally. I'm right there with you. I was living in LA for six years with a pal and we all have that one flight we had to cancel. What was yours? <laughs> oh gosh, what flight? Oh, well, it wasn't my flight technically. My family had to cancel their graduation flights to come see me cross the stage. Mm. So like I didn't have to cancel them, but my family definitely did. Oh yeah. I mean, honestly, that was the first thing that COVID took was all of the pre-laid plans. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a flight that I was going to take to Costa Rica and I had had drawn out my little Google maps, all the best intentions, you know, of like hostel here, backpack there, et cetera. I I honestly canceled it, then rebooked it like three times. I I was being (laughs) stubborn, stubborn. Right. Right. (laughs) I was in Costa Rica when like all my classes went online, but we didn't think anything of it. We didn't know what a pandemic was. We barely mm. knew what COVID was. So we just kept uh-huh. on our spring break. In hindsight, it was probably yeah. really irresponsible, but, but we just didn't know. Like, do we go home? Right. Like, do we? What's the move? Yeah. So we ended up flying back. It was me and two friends on our spring break. 
And so we ended up flying back like the 13th or something. And then the 14th, mm. the 14th, it was packed. Like mm-hmm. everyone flew back. Everyone realized how like serious it was. But, but when, we, when we came back like, on the 13th, it was super smooth. It was just like, yeah. no one really was panicking yet. But in 24 hours, like I came back to St. Louis. That's where I was living for grad school. I went to Trader Joe's. They were cleaning out all of the all of the food, except for the seasonings. Oh my God. Literally. Except for the seasonings, which was very telling because y'all out here eating unseasoned food in a like Come on in, now. <laughs> in a lockdown. Come on but, now. <laughs> but other than, but yeah, it was a wild oh time for gosh. sure. Yeah. You know what? I had that same Trader Joe's dystopian experience. Literally in Los Angeles, me and my roommate, well, we were all watching Love is Blind. I think that was a universal experience <laughs> yeah, at the time. it was. <laughs> and <laughs> you're like, whatever will distract me. The more ridiculous, the better. But I remember mm-hmm. we looked at each other and we were hearing all sorts of crazy things. And we were like, I think we need to go to the grocery store, question mark. Like, I think we need to pack up. And so we went, and like you said, nothing but the seasonings left. And you're just kind of looking at each other, and there's this, like, wild look in everybody's eyes of, like, what is going on here? What What's happening? Yeah, it was wild to look back on all the toilet paper hoarding. I was, it, it was... No. Oh, my gosh. Well, we are so blessed to be in a different space, but with, honestly, so much of the lessons learned through that and... I did end up in Costa Rica eventually, so it all works out, but. (laughs) (laughs) Love that. Yes. So to kick things off, do you mind telling folks listening just a little bit about Sojourneys, your wildly resourceful travel platform that you created in your own words? Yes. So Sojourneys has evolved with me over time. I started in 2015 a run-of-the-mill study abroad blog. I think it was sojourneys.weebly.com back then. Mm. A run-of-the-mill study abroad blog. And now it's essentially a platform for nine-to-fivers who want to check off their career goals and their bucket list dreams to find freedom Mm. and flexibility outside the office. So figuring out how you can use your nine-to-five, because most people do work nine-to-five, despite what social media makes it seem Mm. like most folks are working traditional jobs and so how do we kind of maneuver the travel space and where can we go how do we get there how can we set our career up to possibly help us travel more is is what i do nice that is the current evolution but i've talked about teaching abroad studying abroad interning abroad fellowships abroad i've kind of tried everything right to make it as entrenched into my my lifestyle as much as possible Totally. Yeah. That was something that I was noticing while I was diving through is that, whoa, it covers literally everything. Like one minute you're talking about, you know, internships, studying abroad, et cetera, how you can find money to do that abroad. But then also it's like, hey, review of the Mayan monkey in Tulum. Like, should you stay here or not? <laughs> it's <Yeah>. amazing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm a, I, and I love hostel. So you'll get hostel yes. travel and solo travel and black travel too. But Really, it's about what can we do to kind of make our travel dreams come true without sacrificing the funds that Mm -hmm. helps us kind of get us there. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. And I love how the platform seems to have evolved with your journey, too. Mm -hmm. Like you said, when you were studying abroad to now, you know, that nine to five job and how people can emulate your journey. For sure. Amazing. So aside from leading Sojourneys, you were also a traveling social worker. Let's dive in for a minute into what an average day looks like for you as a remote worker who is constantly on the go. Yeah, an average day. I wish there was an average day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It kind of goes in phases, but so I'm a remote social worker. I think people here traveling social worker and have a different idea, but technically I'm a remote social worker who happens to travel. Mm. Uh, It's kind of like a gray area of the social work field, but an average day, because I work in evaluation and research. So that is like my primarily my my day to day. So on any given day, I can be in a meeting with my team talking about a project, I could have a focus group or an interview or a workshop to do virtually. Most of our work is virtual, I would say 90% of it is virtual, though, though we do have some in person things depending upon like the location of some of my coworkers. Mm. But with that, I'm either like revising questions to ask people in those focus groups and interviews, 
or I'm kind of brainstorming with my team. We work very collaboratively. So it's mm-hmm. a lot of like brainstorming thought partnership on how to ask the best questions in a very limited time frame and how to use our social work background. And we're all black people. So mm-hmm. it's also like a lot of the projects we work on because we're also consultants in evaluation. So that's like our essential role is like, how do we make sure that we're dignifying the folks who are in these programs and who are experiencing Mm. other end of like all of these different services as well. Amazing. I love that breakdown too, because it's showing for folks listening that like, you know, we sometimes think that these digital nomad jobs have to be so like just fully digital, right? Of this new world, like social media manager, you kind of work independently a lot. That's what I do as a freelancer. But I'm loving how a lot of these more like when you think about it, like say your traditional jobs, you're like, no, 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 I can take that show on the road and I can adapt Mm -hmm. it to my lifestyle. Yeah, it's great too. And I keep it in mind, like time zones is a big thing. So I've been kind of in the Western hemisphere right now because I personally, again, work at 4 p.m. to 1 a.m., not my ministry. Well, speaking of staying in the Western hemisphere and traveling about, I'd love to hear like how long do you typically find yourself in a new place? It depends. I've done like a few weeks to a month is generally what I do. I haven't Mm. done a place just because I'm that person. Part of why I'm at home is because I don't know where I want to live in the world. I'm still trying to figure that out. Mm. Yes. Uh, So I do like to say at least two weeks in a place. There are some places I've been to. Like I went to Panama in September and that was more of like a trip trip. But I would like to go back for Mm. longer just to experience more of it right. so I think that's also the good thing that I think people don't understand about digital nomad and remote work not everyone wants to be hopping around from month to month oh gosh yeah like that's not my personal I, I kind of did that when I was living abroad and mm. hopping around on the weekends and stuff so I think I like remote work because I can take my regular vacation and then add like a few days so like, nice. catch like a better flight deal to fly on a Wednesday evening instead of a Sunday one. So So true. I think there are some ways kind of around it, but I would say a few weeks to a month is kind of my maximum. Right. I also love the distinction you just mentioned as a full-time traveler, or at least somebody who's out in these streets Mm -hmm. a lot. There is a big difference between I'm traveling and remote working and I'm on a trip. I have my do not email me sign on. Yeah. (laughs) I think too, I'm in the space now where I'm deciding, okay, where do I want to work remotely from? And like, where do I want to like take a vacation? Mm. Like, what is the difference? Like, I would love to go to Peru, but I don't want to work remotely from Peru. I I really want to go to Machu Picchu. Mm. So it's like, that's more of a trip. But when I was in Guatemala, like I was there for a few days and then did all the hiking that I wanted to do. So there's like some variation that I didn't think about before I had a Mm. remote job, honestly. Right. Yeah, this is the brave new world we're in and all these little distinctions that make up full-time travel, as you put it. And how do you decide on a destination that seems like remote work friendly to you? I do some research. So I'm all in in these Google streets and these TikTok streets trying to figure out where folks <laughs> are kind of going. Like that's kind of how it ended up in Mexico City, obviously has been in the headlines a lot as far as like remote work is concerned. So mm-hmm. I did like more of a trip there and then kind of saw where I'm like, okay, I see the hype. And I also see why people are like, uh, it's a bit too much in in Mexico City. Mm. So I kind of just kind of look and kind of see where folks are talking about. I think I have been staying in this like hemisphere just to kind of, I haven't really traveled. A lot of my travels were in Europe prior to COVID. So this kind of mm. gave me an excuse mm-hmm. to really look and see what's over here. But I kind of Google my way into a place. I'm like, right. okay, Guatemala, yes. I'm hearing a lot about Antigua. Like, like like at the line, like I'm trying, I'm here in all these places. So I kind of yes, just go yeah. and, and kind of here, do a little bit of research. So, okay, let me see if I can find a flight that's reasonable right. to go check it out. Colombia is on my list this year too. I want to spend a month at Colombia, hopefully. That's like big yeah. on my list. I want to travel and work remotely from there. But really it's me, Google, and seeing where, where I can put these funds, essentially. Right, exactly. Who will yeah. take my deposit? Yeah. 100%. I am also a city girl. Like I love, I know people love beaches and like like to work from beaches, but I love mm. cities and I love experiencing new cities. I also am fluent in Spanish, so going to like Latin America oh, is amazing. really nice. I get to use it more and practice. So empowering. And on the subject of Guatemala, which you just mentioned, 
I was actually in your blog and checking out like your guide yeah. to like a solo travel out there because you went viral on Twitter <laughs> not did. too long ago. You eating <laughs> you eating a pizza on a mountain. Can you please just tell yeah. us about that? <laughs> Again, I'd be in these Google and TikTok streets. I had heard where a word on the street was that you can hike for volcanic pizza in Guatemala. I'm like, this mm. can't be real. <laughs> like this is this is not a thing. I did a few little Google searches, found some websites, found some YouTube videos and TikToks and decided, well, when I'm going to go to Guatemala, I was going to Mexico City at the end of last year because my goal last year was to spend all major winter holidays abroad to so like Thanksgiving, Christmas and New Year's. Mm. And so I had decided to go to South Africa, Mexico and Guatemala for those three. And so I ended up over there. I'm like, well, I already plan on going over there and hiking the other volcano. Let me just go ahead and throw this one, mm -hmm. throw this one in here. So yeah, I hiked for pizza, hour and a half, a little bit up here, was out of breath. Yes. But on the way, they give you like, you can buy like Guatemalan hot chocolate too, which is delicious. And then you wow. kind of hike the rest of the way. He made me my pizza. I have veggies, some meat on there, some cheese. He put it under them rocks. <laughs> it came out. Whoa. Yeah. And then they also kind of set up like tables out of some of the rocks and stuff. So they had like a little tablecloth on there he brought my pizza to me and I sat there solo but yeah I love food and so hiking I kind of got into when I started traveling more and thought that was a thing that you can do in a lot of places because mm. you know the midwest is pretty flat so <laughs> right fair enough amazing pizza or bust and honestly back to the topic of zodiac I'm a fellow earth sign okay. and that is okay. some shit we would do like <laughs> We definitely would go up a mountain for pizza and just luxuriate. Like, you'd have to drag me down. I, I kind of drag these things out too much. I'm a high and low Same. traveler. I love a hostel, just like you. But I will also go and get, like, yes. a fancy-ass massage yes. and be like, yes, for 90 minutes. But I will walk back to that bunk bed. <laughs> I'm definitely, like, the flashbacker. Like, I can do a hostel private room because I love the privacy. Oh, yeah. But also, if there's a cool experience, I'm a splurge. <laughs> on that too hence the pizza on a volcano right yes okay you've just said the term flash packer i've been seeing it more and more please what is your definition from what i understand a flash packer is someone who is not a backpacker right we're not like i'm not 20 something younger 20 something anymore which my backpack and a few pairs of clothes mm. i kind of like to bring things I have a skincare routine now. I'm a little, right. a little more adult-ish. And so yep. a flash packer is somebody who likes the kind of style of a backpacker, but it's a little bit more luxurious, mm. kind of wants a little bit extra on top. Right. So somebody like me who will stay in a hostel, but choose the private room instead of the dorm, because I don't want to share a bathroom anymore. Definitely. That was fun back in the day, you know, but... Now I'm kind of looking for a bit more privacy and comfort, et cetera. So that's what I call a flash packer. So if that sounds like y'all, y'all may be with me on that. A 100%, 100%. I, I kind of look at dorms. Like mm -hmm. I honestly, I host group trips and we stay in the dorm. I know right. these girls. That's cool. <laughs> but when I throw myself in a dorm, six to eight bed, and they didn't like clean it that day. Like it's, everybody's mm -hmm. just living. You know, you enter a dorm these days and it's just like full out, like everyone's stuff's already there and you just kind of find your space within the chaos. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's like a rite of passage, especially if you are going to do backpacking. And like when I lived in Spain, definitely still was in the hostel dorm situation because I was on the teacher's mm. salary, like stipend. So like it wasn't wasn't super robust, but it got it was enough to travel. So I do think it's a rite of passage and I always tell people to do it, to do it once at least just to, just to oh, try yeah. it, just to try it. And then, and then, and then you can like hate me later. You've got to. So in one of your tweets, you joke that solo travel will make you realize just how expensive you are. And yeah, that is quite true. Do you mind sharing with us a little bit about the $40 foodie challenge that you started on social media? Yeah, so that was the last year. I actually started traveling more in the U.S. first because I wanted to try out hostels in the U.S. So last year I spent from January to April traveling around the U.S. I went to Charleston, New Orleans, Houston, San Diego, Seattle, and Portland. Mm. San Diego is one of the most expensive cities like in the U.S. So yes. it was like Portland, like the West Coast in general is pretty expensive. So me and one of my friends were like, well, why don't you do like a little foodie challenge? You know, you, you love food. Let's see how much you can get for like $40. And I'm like, 
okay. Yeah. <laughs> and like, let's see what I could do. It's hard though. Oh. oh my gosh. It's so hard. And a lot of that too is like, I want to tip people well. Yeah. So like, it was so difficult. And then it came from like Rachel Ray apparently had a similar series mm. that she did. And so I kind of want to see what it would be like to do it. Yeah, well, on the road. Yeah, just to see. But it was difficult. And it was like one day. I can only do that. And unlike hostels abroad, a lot of hostels here don't like have like free breakfast and those mm. kinds of things. Well, San Diego and Seattle, I think, had like free breakfast okay. in the hostels. But that, those were like the only two. So it was difficult. It was fun, though, trying to find a meal that would fill me up, but also not be super right. expensive. Yeah. What cities were there like particular wins or major fails? I think I failed in both those places. I know I failed in San Diego or I just hit it like $42 or like $45. Like, yeah, it was difficult. But I would say San Diego was the hardest because I went somewhere. I had three pancakes with no size for like $18. No. The Midwest girl in me is like, uh uh-uh. uh, <laughs> like no. diner food is like ten dollars with a full like pancakes, eggs, and some meat or something. So yeah, where's was... the protein? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but I was like, okay, San Diego, I guess. Right. So I say San Diego was definitely the hardest. Portland wasn't as hard because I stayed at Lolo Pass and they had a cafe, so I could mm. like get like a muffin for breakfast, like muffin okay. and tea, mm-hmm. something a bit smaller for for breakfast. But yeah, San Diego and all the other days where I didn't do the challenge, New Orleans, because that's also a food city. And just mm. I want to I want to eat everything. Yeah, everything. there. Totally, totally. So you touched on this briefly when you mentioned that, you know, similar or dissimilar rather to hostels in Europe where they often offer breakfast. I'd love to kind of talk about like what other like differences or just differences in vibes that you noticed during that four month solo trek when you were staying in U.S. hostels last year. Yeah, I would definitely say the breakfast thing. You know, hostels abroad love a good little continental Mm. breakfast kind of service. I mean, I've had omelets in hostels in Mexico. So, oh gosh, yeah. So yeah, good. so to not have anything here was like, okay, y'all, I guess. <laughs> Obviously, the price of hostels in the mm. U.S. is a lot different. I think the cheapest one I stayed at was Wander Stay, and the one in Seattle, which is Green Tortoise, which is like right across from like the Pike Place Market. Okay, so those were, I think were the were the two cheapest of all the cities I went to. I actually really love Wander Stay, just as like a culture wise. It's like the only Black woman owned hostel oh, wow. in the U.S. and so. Like, the staff was also Black, so it, it felt a bit more comfortable just because, like, mm. they're like, hey, girl, you're not from here, but, like, here's where to go. So mm. they're probably the most friendly hostel I've been in, but I find, too, that it's not as social mm. as some of the other ones. And also, granted, I was traveling when Omicron was surging a little bit, mm. so some of the things weren't as available okay. either mm-hmm. just due to COVID, so I will say that, but... Price, definitely more expensive to, to mm. travel in hostels, especially I was staying for two weeks in some places. And so okay. that was definitely a bit like longer than I would normally do. Some of them did have activity. I, I feel like the one in San Diego, I say that Samsung Ocean Beach. Oh, yeah. I think they cater more to international people anyway, but they had activities and things right. to do every day of the week. And the one in Seattle did too. So that was kind of similar, but they weren't like bar crawls. I feel like that's a really a thing that most hostels oh do abroad. Oh my gosh. And yeah. I didn't see as many, as many of those. Right, right. And you did mention they were more expensive. Do you feel like you were getting that bang for your buck? Or was it just like, oh, it's America or it's the States. It's just expensive. Yeah, I kind of knew it was going to be expensive. I was like, uh, like I stayed in one of the Salinas in New Orleans. I'm like, this is definitely boutique. Mm. So I knew that I knew it was going to be a bit more expensive. And obviously, like I stayed in the private rooms for most of it just because due to COVID, I didn't want to get sick on the road. Mm. But I feel like if I would have done the dorms, obviously it would have been a bit cheaper okay. in my backpacker days. But I kind of anticipated they would be expensive. So I made sure to balance out like my food and like other mm. things just to make sure that the prices weren't too ridiculous. But not going to lie, towards the end there, like San Diego, Portland, Seattle, trifecta Oof. was a bit pricey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the moments when you're like, I am glad I'm on a salary for yeah, sure. No, I'm like, there's no way. And also I, I knew there was no way I could do this at any other point in my life. I had been living at home and saved up enough where I had the mm. flex. Okay. 
Yeah. And demographically, like, where were people from when you were in these U.S. hostels? Houston and San Diego had the most international populations. Like, I met a lot of people from, like, the Caribbean. Okay. Obviously, because Houston is kind of the entryway for a lot of people to get to other parts of the U.S. So Mm. there were some... People thought I was like Haitian or something. Like they asked me where I was from. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm like, oh, I'm from the U.S., which is kind of funny considering mm-hmm. I'm in the U.S. in hostels. San Diego, surfer, like oh, beach. Oh, so true. So like you have more of like the Australians, Europeans, New Zealanders, like mm. New Orleans. I thought it was more of U.S. tourists just because New Orleans is a, is a hot spot for us anyway. And then Charleston was kind of empty. Like it weren't many people visiting. I didn't see too many while I was there. Right. Okay, cool. I love that we're talking about the San Diego hostel. I'm like totally slipping on the name right now. But I remember I came back from Europe on a trip and I was like, I just missed the vibe. And I took myself from LA to San Diego via the train. And I was like, let's recreate some vibes here. And you're right. There were some very cute surfers (laughs) from all over the world. (laughs) Loved it. (laughs) So during this trip, you were traveling by train between cities? Sometimes between train. Like I went from San Diego to LA on the, I think we parts of the same train, the Pacific Surfer Liner through Amtrak. So I took that train to then take the Coast Starlight from LA to Seattle. Okay. And then I took the train from Seattle to Portland. And I was supposed to take the train from Portland back to Milwaukee, but it got canceled because they had like this wild winter storm in like the Dakotas. Whoa. Like I was high key hungover that morning. And so I had to hungoverly book a flight back to Milwaukee. <laughs> oh, no. The hungoverly. <laughs> that, oof. You know what? On the subject of evolving through travel and like growing up and stuff, um, I am so glad that I have evolved a little bit out of that. Like, honestly, if someone's like, should we stay up until our whatever flight or whatever train in the morning? I'm like, no, absolutely not. And then you know what? Shit does always hit the fan the next day with like little bits, you know, like not maybe as big as, oh, my God, the whole train has been canceled. I now have to figure shit out. But you're just in this space where you're like, um, if I was hungover right now, I would literally be hating my life. I don't know if I could do this. <laughs> yeah, those those days of like, we'll just sleep in the airport. Like, uh, no. Instead of booking a hostel, no. those days are over. I definitely did them. I I, I definitely did them for like a oh year God. when I was living in Spain. But but that was it. I'm like, I can't do this anymore to my body. Like, I just right. I can't do it. Right. Yeah. No, I've never done the let's just sleep in the airport. But I know people who have. And I don't mean to be this person, but they're always Australian. <laughs> they're always crazy Australian dudes that are like, we don't need a room. We'll just figure it out. Peak season. Like, yeah, you needed a room. You needed a room. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you did. Yeah, I I stayed out all night, like in Brussels. Like, we're like, we'll just stay out all night. And the way I was so tired. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my God. The things we did in our early to mid 20s that just, if I tried now, whoa. And like, I thought I could still do it. I'm like, "Mm -mm, Mm. no, you can't, girl. (laughs) Yeah, the angel on your shoulder is like, please stop. No, legit. (laughs) Oh my gosh. So funny. So. On the subject of train travel, not hangoverly, what is one misconception about train travel within the States that you just want to set the record straight on for once and for all? That you can't live without Wi-Fi. I don't know why Mm. folks act like two days without (gasps) Wi-Fi is like their life ending. That's the number one Mm. complaint, like comment I get across platforms is like, oh my God, no Wi-Fi. I could never. I'm like, really? Really? Like 48 hours, like you couldn't just enjoy and like relax. So I think the misconception is that you're going to get bored mm. on a train. And that's just not, not true. And granted, I do book the roommates. I do splurge because like if I'm on there for two and a half mm. days, like I would like to be comfortable. I, that's what I choose to do. But you're in the observation car. You can bring a book. How nice. Like if you're not traveling solo, even I bring like card games. I meet people on mm. the train. So like I make conversation and stuff. And so... I may have like a deck of Uno so cards nice. or a deck of playing cards, you know? So it's always nice to kind of have those things. But I think the biggest misconception is that because you don't have Wi-Fi, you'll be bored. And I've never been bored right. on the train. Like, 
it's a good time. Like, relax. Look, look out the window. People watch. Right. Right. Yeah. And as someone who is remote working consistently, like, it's an invitation to unplug. Yes. Yes. And I love that there isn't Wi-Fi. I mean, I'm sure eventually they're probably going to get Wi-Fi on the trains in the future. Mm. But right now, people are like, well, do you work on the train? No, because I'm watching the mm. news. Part of the allure of train travel, especially in the U.S., is that you're also like enjoying the view. Right. That's the vibe. And so I don't want to work. Fair. Now, I may write like for my blog or something like that because it doesn't really require Wi-Fi. So I may just write an article during a non-scenic mm. part or something like that. But truthfully I just want to relax and you are such an advocate of train travel but within that answer just now I have several questions because I I don't know this stuff like what is a roommate (laughs) yeah so a roommate is like I don't want to say it's a dorm room because it's way smaller than that but it's like a little room on the train in the sleeper car so they have the coach which is just the seats you know next to each other some trains have like the business class with like a bit bigger seats on the routes. And then you have the roomettes, which are like the little room. So roomette, little room, like quite literally. Okay. So it's like a bunk bed. As a solo traveler, I normally use the bottom bunk because the top bunk, even for me, I'm 5'1 and pretty petite, mm. but it's pretty small, even, even, even for me. So I normally use the bottom bunk and then there's like a little, like a little table. They have like something to hang up your okay. coat, like a little closet. There isn't a bathroom in the routes that I have taken, but I know it exists on some other routes that have the bathroom in the roomette. But honestly, I don't know if I want to do that. Separation. Separation. So but like the roomette, it's like, it's like a little room. So it's just me and like a little bunk bed and you can have the windows as well. So if you don't yeah. want to sit in the observation car or the sightseer lounge on Amtrak, you can go and look out the window from your roommate mm-hmm. and just have your journal. It's like one of them dramatic like music videos. Like that's, that's kind of the vibe. Okay. Yeah. So you get the roommate by yourself. Have you ever split a roommate? I did with my sister. She actually flew to LA so that we could take Mm -hmm. the train from LA to Seattle. And we decided that the roommate is probably best for one person. (laughs) We were like, it was fine. But doing with her, it's like, "Mm, we probably could have got a bedroom on the train. And so I kind of wanted to try it out. I wasn't thinking. I'm like, it would have been nice to try out a bedroom to see how that feels. Because like, I'm solo, so I'm probably not going to book that. On my own, but having somebody else. And I feel like bedrooms do have the bathroom in there. They think they have like a little couch in the bed. Like it's a bit more spacious. Wow, nice. Okay, I'm having flashbacks to the one time I think I was in a room at, but I was with strangers and I was hungover. (laughs) It was from, it was an overnight from Madrid to Barcelona. And I remember being like, yeah, no, this is going to be great. No idea what I was getting myself into. Yeah, they. I remember they pulled out three beds from the wall, and I was like, "Oh, I didn't even know there was room for all that." <laughs> and I was on the bottom, and oh, I was just wow. like, "There was like this much space between me and the bed right above." And you're just like, "Okay, would I ever do that again in that fashion? No. Would I upgrade in your fashion? Absolutely." Yeah. Oh, I don't know how I would feel about the strangers in the room. That's really close. It was, you know, I think one of them was a nun, and so I was like, "Okay, I think we're good." Um, (laughs) I feel like with train travel, like you probably know this more than others. It's like, there's the highs and lows. You want to splurge and it's going to be a whole other experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That's why I would recommend it. I'm like, I know it's more expensive, but like the way my back is set up, Mm. (laughs) like my limbs and stuff, I don't want to be crammed into coach so you know i'm a single person right now i don't have to worry about nobody else so i'm a i'm a splurge while i can the best (laughs) love that and you briefly said that one of the trains you had ridden was like two days long like what what is the longest train Mm -hmm. you've ever ridden yeah the longest one was my first scenic train ride so milwaukee to chicago is on like Mm -hmm. an hour and a half on amtrak and it takes you from downtown milwaukee to downtown chicago so i've taken the train i'll be bored like i'm gonna go eat in chicago today i've literally like hopped on the train went there for a day and came back (laughs) to milwaukee but the scenic train ride the california zephyr is 52 hours whoa so i had to go milwaukee to chicago chicago to emeryville california and that's with no delays. I had a mm-hmm. seven hour delay. So it was closer to 60 on the yeah. train itself, but it was two days, you know, and like it was cool because I got to hang out with the sleeper car attendants too, who are kind of help you like put your bed mm-hmm. down and ask you what what time you want to eat for your meals in the dining car because that's included when you book the roommate. Yeah, that's the longest train ride I've taken and the longest I've seen just because mm-hmm. the US is so massive. 
like I've Googled long seeing a train rides in Europe and they're like 12 hours oh. and stuff. But for us, that's not necessarily long. Yeah, you wouldn't get too far in the US. Yeah, 12 hours may get you to another part of the Midwest. Right. But it's not going to get you to a coast. So we'll see if that's the longest one I'll ever take. I don't know. I Amazing. Haven't. Collecting them like Pokemon. Sounds great. (laughs) Legit, legit. That's my goal is to take as many as possible across every continent. So cool. So on So Journeys, like you were sharing, you honestly have like such a robust blog and you put your audience on game to a plethora of ways that they can fund their full-time travels like you do. You cover things like teaching, studying, and intern abroad, but you also have a treasure trove of information about international fellowships, which might be a bit more foreign to some listening and also me. (laughs) Mind giving us the lowdown on what international fellowships are and who they might most benefit? Yeah, so I stumbled upon international fellowships as an undergrad trying to figure out what do I do now, Mm. (laughs) which I feel like is a very common place to be. And so after I studied abroad, I decided I didn't want to go straight to grad school. And so I said, I think I want to go live abroad for a little bit. Like, And like, how do I do that? Because I don't have like gap year money. (laughs) Like Mm. I don't have no trust fund money. Mm -hmm. So what's a way I can do that, but still kind of support myself. And I had learned about the Fulbright program right before I went abroad didn't think I could do it because I majored in psychology and Spanish and it was like an education based program but because of my experience I wanted to be a school psychologist initially like working with youth and working with kids and like ESL classrooms and just in general every summer I had enough classroom experience to kind of justify applying so that's how I found out about them but essentially they are one or two year contracts depending upon the fellowship program where you're able to go work abroad in a certain field So mine was teaching English abroad. There's a bunch of other ones like Fulbright has a pretty robust application system, Mm. but there are other programs. The North American Language Culture Assistance in Spain is like the popular one that folks do. I think like CIEE has like their own different teach abroad programs. So those are those aren't called fellowships. That's essentially what they are, are opportunities for you to work abroad Mm. for a year. Just that Fulbright calls it a fellowship. And there are others too. There's a website called ProFellow that has a whole database where you can put in what you want to study, like what your major is in, like what you want to do. And they kind of can tell you these are all the fellowships you can apply for. And they can be for like six months, three months, nine months, one year, wow. two year. Like they have a bunch Amazing. of different different things. And they're really good for people coming right out of undergrad who want to get work experience, mm. but don't want to like kind of go into a nine to five kind of style. Okay. Um, so I think I worked like 16 hours a week when mm. I was in Fulbright. So I had every Friday off. So I would travel essentially on right. the weekends or go to like a winery or something like that in yes. Spain. So I think they're great. And also they have mid, mid-career mid ones too now. So if you're somebody listening who's kind of been working for like five years or something mm. like that, and you want to pivot in something else or kind of pivot your skill set abroad, ProFellow has a bunch of those too. I think they're really cool in the middle opportunities for folks to take their career to the next level without having to quit or be unemployed. (laughs) Yeah, fair enough. I love how travel is evolving. And it's just like you said, like mid-career to just like maybe even older opportunities. And you're like, okay, I don't have to be 18 or on a gap year. Like Mm -mm. who had it figured out at gap year? Literally no one ever. No, (laughs) no. I saw a tweet that was like, your 20s are still your teens, okay? Like, I am I am a teenager until I'm 30 years old. <laughs> no, legit. I feel like I'll be 29 this year. And I feel like I'm just coming into, like, mm. my own. It's like, yeah. I can't imagine. And seeing people now, like, on social media talking about, I don't live in a high rise at 20, babes. The average person babes. ain't living in no high rise at no. 20 years old. Who's been lying to you? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, thank you for sharing. And for those that are listening that their ears perked up at that, So Journeys is going to be linked in this episode's description. So like dive in, honey, get the tabs going because there is a lot. So as someone who has lived all over the US as well as Spain and Germany, you've fostered community all over the world time and time again. What are some of your tried and true methods for establishing new connections or discovering new haunts in places where you very well might not know a soul? One, I would say language learning is a really mm. big one, especially if you're in a place longer term. Like if you're in a place for like a month, it may be a bit 
you know, the investment part, but it's always good to kind of know some words and phrases. But I think language learning has really helped rebuild community. Like I had a Spanish roommate when I was in Spain and I had a Spanish roommate and two French roommates and the common language was Spanish. Okay. So yeah. having that was like a way we could build community. I would also say that something I wish I did I took like a photography class to meet people at like, like a community center mm. or something like that. So finding a hobby, but also if you Ooh. play a sport, yeah, that's like a universal language. Y'all have to even know mm-hmm. the language. Mm. So I wish I would have been more into sports when I was abroad. But if not, finding like a community center or a different class you can take to like meet locals somehow. And I end up making some friends there. Yeah, I will say the one thing that I, that remote work that I missed from like, working abroad is having that in-person interaction Mm. with people in a country i feel like it's a lot harder when you're behind a screen it's like in a co-working space Mm. to kind of mimic that so true so if you're somebody who's like remote work is not for me which is not for everyone right and you want to do like international fellowship or work abroad i think tapping into those co-workers Mm. and getting to know them i know when i interned in berlin i got to know my co-workers pretty well even though i was only there for a summer just kind of talking to them and hearing about their experience in berlin and what things i should do and yeah. shouldn't do and all that kind of stuff was really really helpful and then the markets i meet so many people mm. at markets just like they're like oh where you're from i'm from here I'm like oh let me like show you around that's happened yes. many times so nice so i say the markets are where it's at Okay. Yeah. I love it. These feel really wholesome and they don't necessarily involve drinking all the time, which is honestly, as a full-time remote worker, it's not sustainable. Mm -mm. You know, you have places to be, you have Zooms to to hang out in. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you want to throw a bar crawl in there on a Friday, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. (laughs) But but me going out on a, like a Monday night to a bar crawl is not going to happen these days. You know what? I'm going to throw in a tip you threw in earlier when we were on the train topic of you always have like a little carta uno or like little spontaneous moments like that. Yeah. I like carrying around little things because also car games are a way to kind of teach someone about your culture that doesn't seem like invasive, like Mm. talking about politics that can be really contentious or, (laughs) you know, kind of getting into the like keeping it lighthearted. Yeah. Like, I don't know you, you know me, but let's play this game together. Right. And kind of see how we how we work together. So I love speed. It's like my other favorite car game that I kind of I kind of have in my Rolodex, too. Oh, you know what? That's really taking me back. I did like a backpacking journey through Eastern Europe. My trip was supposed to be a month, turns into six. You know how that goes. And I became so good at carts. Like, I think it was speed. Is speed the one where it's like you see doubles or you see a sandwich or whatever? Honestly, I had that on me. I had that thing on me. Like, (laughs) Mm -hmm. didn't matter where you were from. Because, like, everybody's, like, a little bit competitive. You may not be, like, a sore loser competitive, but you got a little little edge in there. And so mm-hmm. I found that card games are, are, like, are like fun. Truly. I felt like Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic when he, like, wins the, the tickets to go on the Titanic, has a cigarette in his mouth. And I'm like, so there's a sandwich and there's a double and then there's this. And then people are like, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it so much. So now you know we had to go there. <laughs> what has dating been like for you while traveling full time? Has there been any standout experiences? Dating is funny. <laughs> it is truly a funny experience because mm-hmm. I wasn't someone who really thought much about it. Like I would meet people on bar crawls, you know, have some makeout sure. sessions in clubs, like that <laughs> kind of stuff. But taking it beyond that, I feel like part of me, I know maybe it's the Virgo, like the realist kind of mm-hmm. in me it's just like I don't know if I'm gonna invest in this for real like this is fun mm-hmm. but it's like what's that like mm-hmm. but I think for me it's been those experiences like me going to markets and people like hey I'll show you around so we end up hanging out like the whole day or the next day yeah. or stuff like that you know you exchange stuff on WhatsApp is really mm-hmm. fun is <laughs> to just to kind of keep in contact I remember I was in Prague. I met out with a guy in a club and then the next minute got kicked in the head by somebody else in the club. Like it was I'm sorry. What? It was just it we were in like this five story club in Prague and it was like mm. saw a guy dance together, kiss, whatever, like went over here to my friends and on the second level, this other guy kicked me in the head. Kicked you in the head? I thought it was <laughs> kicked him in the head. I was like, what? No, he kicked me. No, and it was like, 
I was like, I know I've made out with you, but I got a headache now. So, I gotta go. Like, it's very Adventures of an Awkward Black Girl for me <laughs> kind of scenarios. But I would say I'm deceased. there's definitely been, like, day-long flings and, like, I'll show you around, kind of take you to my mm. favorite places. But I kind of really like. That's really fun. Oh, yeah. That's my speed. Yeah, that's, like, my favorite <laughs> thing. Like, a tour guide. Like, hey, do you want me to give you a private tour and, like, show you. Hello. <laughs> show you around are, like, my favorite uh, kind of travel right. experiences. Because, like, they're fun. Like, I'm not somebody mm-hmm. who, like, I don't need to eat, pray, love situation. Like, I just want to enjoy myself. Let's add a little seasoning, if you will, yeah. to this day, to this trip. Yeah. Nothing serious. So something fun, something chill, not overthinking it, because who knows? So true. Point. So true. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I think it's something about, again, about these fellow earth signs. I was just on the phone talking about this fling I had in Guadalajara. And my friend was like, dude, how do you not just get so swept up? Like, I would be gone. And I was like, you're a cancer. I'm a Taurus. Like, I'm a romantic realist. Oh, that's relatable. Yeah. And so, like, for me, it's like one of those things where I'm like, okay, you could pleasantly surprise me. But until then, I'm going to keep it real. And I'm just going to enjoy what this is, which is we haven't had any grown up conversations. You can't put any barriers on people if you have, haven't been grown up enough to talk about, well, what are we doing if you're not going to have that conversation? Right. Just enjoy it. Oh, that's funny. I'm a Taurus rising, I think. So I'm like a double, okay. I'm a double earth sign. She's grounded, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Too grounded to my to a fault, probably. But I agree, like, being a romantic realist is definitely my speed. Like, I love all of the, the lovey-dovey things, but also I'm here for, like, a week. <laughs> like, I'm here for no, two seriously. weeks. I'm here for, like, a month. So, like, let's just enjoy it for what it is and not try to make it more. And then, you know, maybe one day I will get, like, sort of off my feet. That ain't happened yet. But for now, I'm just kind of enjoy the mm. enjoy the fun parts. Yes, yes. I love that. And honestly, to each their own zodiac signs. I know my cancer friend out there is like, hey. Why don't we just fall in love right now? And I'm like, mm. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. So funny. So what is next for you? What do you got coming up? Well, I do have a few train rides. I'm taking the one in Mexico, the El Chepe Express. So that's exciting. And staying in like their Copper Canyon, which is like four mm. times the size of Grand Canyon. Okay. So I'm really excited for that. It's a mix of like train adventure and like relaxation in nature. So I can get a bit of relaxation while I'm on my trip. And then I have another train trip to Canada. I've never been to Canada, actually. So that's like Mm, a first. Nice. Kind of going wherever the wind takes me, but also have some bucket list places on there. Okay, yeah. And wherever the sky scanner deals are sky scanning. (laughs) Wherever they say, hey, here's a flight out of Milwaukee or Chicago. Go ahead and book it. I love that. Well, lastly, how can folks keep up with you and your travels? Yeah, I'm across all like I'm not hiding anywhere. I am at Sojourneys on Twitter, TikTok, and then at the Sojourneys on Instagram. I do have a YouTube page where I post some vlogs every now and again called Sojourneys. My website is Sojourneys.com. Should I have an irresponsible digital footprint? I'm not hiding. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me. You can find me anywhere. So yeah, that's how you can find me. I'll be posting all of the adventures. And balancing a nine to five while doing it and providing lots of tips along the way. Amazing. Truly superwoman because you have so much content out there. So helpful. And you got a job. I'm just shook. But... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the Virgo, like the 5 a.m. workout girly in me, too. We are running up those hills, are we not? Nobody's telling us to. No. No. Love it. Well, thank you so much for joining. And you guys, we'll catch you next time. Enchanté. To keep up with Sojourner and all her journeys, sorry, I just had to, shoot her a follow across social media and head to her blog, sojourneys.com, all of which will be linked in this episode's description. Want to link up with like-minded Globe Thoughties from all over the world? Find your squad by joining Globe Thoughters Facebook group. Our Facebook group is a private space to ask all your travel cues, swap stories, and meet up with other adventurers on your wavelength. The Facebook group is also the first to hear about any trips I've got coming up and how you can join me. So to join the squad, all you got to do is search Globe Thoughter Travel Gang on Facebook. The link is also in this episode's description. Lastly, Globe Thoughters Hotline is open and waiting to hear your epic travel stories. You never know, your juicy story might just be featured on the pod. 
All you gotta do is go to speakpipe.com slash globethoughter or click the link in this episode's description. Leave an up to 90 second voicemail detailing your travel tale. A quickie, if you will. Want to stay anonymous? No name is required to leave a voicemail. Till next time, I'm Cassie Martinez.